So everybody, I, uh, terribly sorry that I've uh, run so awfully off the of uh, My name is Jay Kidd. I am the creative director for Wraith Games. We are a studio just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, we've been around since about 2005. They're, they're 12 plus. Um, so the thing is that accessibility is something that is super important. It is vital when you are creating games in the games industry. Because if you don't include it, you're going to be excluding so many players who would otherwise buy your game. You know, you're, you're taking an entire experience and walling it off to people. Now, why is it that it's so often, like, glossed over? You know, if you go into a lot of games, you know, going around, looking at accessibility options, and there's just nothing. There's absolutely nothing. Why is that? Well, today I'm going to talk about how to implement some accessibility options. Our primary focus on this is going to be colorblindness. And you're probably thinking, uh, you turn off the projector. Why do you turn off the projector? Are you going to be doing slides and everything? No. No. Um, mostly because it's not really necessary. A lot of this stuff is about methodology. And the type of methodology you have to implement in order to make your games more accessible. And then, after colorblindness, I'll also talk about all sorts of other types of accessibility, and then I'm going to open this whole thing up to questions. So, accessibility. Why is it important? Well, the answer is because almost all of us know someone who has some sort of disability. And it's often some sort of disability where they're unable to enjoy a game to its fullest extent. You know, like, even if you don't know someone who has no control over their hand, even if you don't know anyone who's blind or who's deaf, I almost guarantee you you know someone who's colorblind. I mean, uh, <laughs> about one-fifth of all men are colorblind, you know? Uh, it's about one-twelfth of all women, but even then, that's a, that's a lot of people, right? So, have you ever been playing an MMO, and you're like, okay, my people are in green on the minimap, and their people are in red. So they're the bad guys. Just think about that for a second. The most color, uh, the most common color blindness is red green color blindness. And yet, some some big dev team out there went all the way from design document to pre-production to planning to to art and development, all the way through playtesting to release, and still somehow didn't catch that, oh, most people can't, can't see that. And one of the big reasons for that is, oftentimes, playtesters, you know, especially pre professional playtesters, will be like, well, I can sort of parse that those guys are the bad guy, you know? My, my disability isn't really that common, you know? I, I don't really have to report that I can't see it. Or even worse, when you have playtesters who are like, hey, um, I've noticed, um, I can't tell those apart. And then some sort of produ uh, production designer is like, what do you mean you can't tell them apart? The, those guys are, are red, and our guys are green. Like, no, no, I'm colorblind. And they're like, okay. Nothing comes of it. Nothing at all. Like, what? Because they're not colorblind, those, those uh, production de designers today. I'm, I have no you know, reason to cater to such a small population of players. Do you know what it would have taken to make it where, at the very minimum, at the very, very minimum, your guys were like blue <laughs> and those guys were like red? There are very, very few color blindnesses. In fact, the only one I can think of off the top of my head, a chromatopsia, which is true black and white color blindness, can't tell the difference. Do you know how many people have a chromatopsia? I'm giving this talk and I don't know how many people have a chromatopsia. I think it's less than 100 in the United States. Like, it's, it's criminally, criminally small. Even then, people with the chromatopsia are very good at detecting shades. And that's actually your key to a lot of color blindness. Shades. So who here, taking this, uh, listening to this talk right now, works in graphic art or in some sort of games art? OK, so basically half of you. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you are game designers? 
the rest. Neat. Okay, cool. So this is something that if the game designer doesn't catch it, then later on, you know, the, uh, the game's artist will catch it. Never let it get to the game's artist. Never make it a decision that the game's artist has to make to, to choose colors that are colorblind friendly. This should be baked into the beginning of your design because the earlier you catch this, the earlier you decide when you want to actually like include color blindness options or any accessibility options, literally any, the smoother it will be to implement. Now, I will also say this, who here is also a programmer? The designers mostly, okay, interesting. <laughs> that's some double role stuff right there, that's difficult. Okay, so the thing is that um, some of the other accessibility options I'll be talking about near the end, those were involve around a programmer who's actually sitting down and, and programming some different things. Uh, but again, good design sort of mitigates that. Um, on one big colorblind solution, my favorite colorblind solution, which will be what I'm building up into, uh, it actually is also a coding solution as well as an art solution as well as a design solution, and that means it takes uh, about a week to implement in any given game, which is not a lot of time. Let's be really honest. Uh, when I say a week, I'm talking about a week of just sort of like messing around, like, eh, I can do this every once in a while. Um, colorblind stuff is not hard to implement. So. What am I talking about? Shades, okay, they can get shades. You got really sidetracked somewhere around there. Well, it's kind of important to know what roles you have so I can better cater this talk. Shades and value. Um, the value of the color, how black and white it is, what variant of gray it is, is vastly important to people with achromatopsia. And not so surprisingly, anyone with color blindness. Because even if you're green and you're red, or you're red and you're green, look alike, if they're different shades from one another, you're going to be able to tell them apart. Like, okay, on the mini-map, I know that that is supposed to be red and this is supposed to be green, but this is a dark green and that's a, that's a light red. That's going to be able to be like, okay, yeah, no, it's kind of clumsy, but I can get the difference there. Another brilliant, brilliant thing about value, about actual, like, gradient of, of black and white is the fact that you can actually design all of your textures, literally all of them, with value in mind. And then you just sort of put the color on top of it. Say you're in Photoshop, you know, for the, for the, artists, uh, for the artists out there. If you're in Photoshop, you can design all the little darker bits just to be dark gray and all the, the really dark bits to be black. And you can put in, like, or near black. And you can put in all the lighter bits to be a really light gray, things like that. And then on your next layer, you can then go in and paint over that with just a blue. You know, like, oh, and now those light bits are really nice light blue. It's really cool. As long as they are all within the same sort of family of shade, and that's uh, based off of your tint within your, um, within your Photoshop little sliders, um, then that means that if someone with a chromatopsia were to look at it, regardless of if this bit was blue or if this bit was red or if this bit was anything, as long as they're within the same value family, they're going to look very, very similar to the black and white image to them, which is really cool. You also then have the ability to, and this is where the programmer solution comes in, make every single texture in your game be black and white. Well, some shade of gray. Because then, if you're using something like Unreal or something like Unity, you can have it where each individual texture is a smaller section. Those light bits of the shirt, those are all one texture section. That means that you tell the engine, oh, you know that one bit of, of yellow? Or that one bit of, uh, of white? That's yellow. And then the engine will be like, okay, I'm going to paint that yellow. But because it's, it's a gray, it'll actually turn up as being a darker yellow than true yellow. Or if you go really dark, it'll be like really closer to a dark yellow. It's a programming solution for an art problem. But it, you need your artist to be able to be like, oh, no, this is, this is something that I can do. Everything in black and white. 
And the shockingly amazing part of doing it like this, your art will always look better if you have value in mind. So I'm going to talk briefly about one of our artists at Wraith, Lance T. Miller. He's absolutely wonderful. He worked in uh, the playing card industry and the board game industry before working with Wraith. He actually still does uh, playing cards and board games. Well, he took on a job for Rio Grande Games. They, uh, you may know them for doing Dominion, you know, the really wonderful card game Dominion. Well, he was working on a new project called Santa's Workshop. Now, really sadly, they didn't get to put as much colorblind options into the game as they wanted to. They wanted differently shaped pieces rather than a bunch of colored squares, but there just wasn't enough time in production. However, he had started doing all of his art pretty early on, and this was his first really huge board game project. And he realizes, like, ah, you know, something about this just isn't working. You know, it, it, everything seems kind of muddy, you know, like I can't, it just doesn't have that pop that I wanted. And then he started working with value art. He started working with uh, creating all of his art in black and white, and then putting over those swaths of color on top of that for a board game. He was making the exact same art, but designing it in value, and it looked so much sharper, so much better. And that's actually one of the reasons why if you look at AAA concept art, you'll see like a black and white version with the palette over on the side. And then they're like, okay, we're just going to start experimenting with colors over top of this pre-existing value. Because they know what the dark bits are going to be, and they know what the light bits are going to be. That's something that they've already planned for. And then they get to make you know, multiple color palettes for these same enemies or like different character color options. It's great, great stuff. So if they're already doing it like that, why not just put in a tool that says, okay, here's a color wheel. Anytime you see yellow, it's actually blue and the player can pick that. That's your code solution right there. That's your design solution. Come up with, I don't know, 10, and there's a reason I say 10, colorblind palettes. 10 palettes where you can say, okay, yeah, someone with a chromatopsia can see this. Someone with uh, tetrachromia can see this. Someone with deuterochromia can see this. Someone with protonopoly can see this. For those of you who don't know, those are different types of colorblindnesses. There are 10 common colorblindnesses. That's why I say 10 palettes. Well, sorry, there are nine c common color blindnesses, and then there's a default palette for people who don't happen to have any sort of uh, color anomaly, anomaly. Create these palettes by going and picking up a color blindness tool. If you go onto the Able Gamers website, they have a link to a tool which allows you to take any image and see it like someone with this color blindness. It's really neat. You're like, I want to see this like someone with a chromatopsia. And it just goes all black and white. Like, oh, I want to see this like someone with protonopoly. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh man, cyans and pinks everywhere. It's cool. It's really neat. And then you can start looking at your art and be like, oh, uh, yeah, no, I can't make out half of this. That's weird. One of the really neat things is if you just Google right now, colorblind palette on Google. And yeah, no, I said literally right now, if you want to pick up a computer, go Google it. Colorblind palette. You will see several images where it has the different color blindnesses compared and has the whole like lines for what their color equivalent looks like. If you're dealing with a if you're dealing with someone who can't really see red particularly well, you can look there and be like, what is the most bold red I can get? And you just pick that. You just pick the hex code for that. Pull it up in Photoshop. It takes five minutes, people. People think that colorblind accessibility is difficult, but all it really needs is some forethought. Be like, this is our default red for this Deuteranopia palette. Done. This is our default blue for our Protonopia palette. Done. There's your 10 palettes and you have the code fill that in, and then you create a tool that allows the players in code to set those color parameters themselves. Because at the end of the day, player choice is always the best. Especially because not only are you gonna cater to people who have color blindness, did you know that of people who are considered legally blind, less than 1% of them are truly blind? 
sometimes being able to be like, I'm going to make most of these graphics really dark and then all of my HUD stuff really light, just up the bloom just on the HUD stuff, can be the difference between someone who is legally blind not being able to play your game and being able to play your game. Just contrast. It's that simple. This doesn't just cater to people with color blindness, and it doesn't just cater to people with actual blindness. People with migraines can often have color sensitivities. People with certain types of epilepsy can have certain color sensitivities. There's, a, like for a lot of like text and everything, it can actually trigger people with dyslexia. And I'm going to tell you, as a dyslexic, yeah, no, if I see another bit of cyan text again in my life, I'm going to murder someone. Because it just does not compute. So the thing is that at the end of the day, maybe someone just wants to have a red coat in their game. And so they'll be like, I'm going to get a blue coat, and then I'm just going to change all, all blue to red. Screw it. Why not? Player options are not a problem. Player options are definitely not a problem when you tell them. If you're in an options menu, and by the way, there's a debate right now going on in the accessibility community as to whether or not um, you should actually have a, an accessibility options menu. Some people say, yes, that points out that there's a whole bunch of accessibility options ra rather than being like, you know, you have your like gameplay and your sound and your graphics. And then all the way at the bottom, you have accessibility. Some people really like that. I personally am against it. I think that all of your colorblind stuff should be in graphics. Because not everyone knows that your game is going to have these options. Not everyone knows that they'll even benefit from these options. And a lot of people wouldn't even think to look at an accessibility menu even if it was there, unless they see it as a recurring problem. My wife didn't find out she was colorblind until she had been living with me for three years. She was in her mid-twenties before she found out she was colorblind. And it's hilarious because her dad is. And he would give, uh, she would give him so much crap about it. Because, you know, families, they tease each other. Families are awful. But no, she actually took a color, like, I'm like, because we were talking about art and everything. And she's like, no, I can't tell the difference between these two colors. And, and I'm like, that's purple and green, hon. <laughs> and she's like, what? And so she went, and she actually took a colorblind test. And she's like, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm colorblind. And I'm like, and you went your entire life without knowing this. She wouldn't have known. She wouldn't have known she could benefit from that. But I can almost guarantee you, if there's a color wheel just sticking out in the graphics options, people are going to mess with it. Absolutely. Now, if you're afraid of these colorblind options or any accessibility options taking away from the gameplay experience that you have meticulously crafted for your players, all you have to do is when they start messing with it, pull up a little warning and say, say, hey, just so you know, you're about to enable this option. You could always change back. The designers did not intend the game to be played like this. However, have fun. That's what Celeste did. If any of you have played Celeste on Steam, it's a wonderful sort of, uh, sort of platformer game. It's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely amazing, and they have the coolest accessibility options menu. You can turn off death in the accessibility options menu, and it's just like, hey, just so you know, you're not going to die. If that's not a problem for you, go on ahead. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Having players be able to play the way they want to play will not damage your game. The idea that games are authored solely by the creator is, is it's ridiculous. Every time someone sits down to play a game, they are authoring their own experience. It's interactive, mm, sorry, it's interactive fiction, it's interactive storytelling, it's interactive art. And that interaction, giving people a more of a breadth of options for that interactivity, <laughs> That's where it gets cool. That's where you give them more control over their own authorship. Colorblindness. Colorblindness is probably the easiest thing to fix. But it's one of the le least addressed. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, talking about easiest to address, I'm, I'm actually going to move on to some other accessibility options. That's OK. Now, I am, like I said, going to be uh, doing some Q&A at the end of this. Uh, so if there are any more questions about colorblindness, 
I will very much answer those. So, remappable controls. Who here likes remappable controls? Only a few of you like remappable controls. So I'm kind of interested as to those of you who don't like remappable controls. Is it that you're against them, or is it just that you don't use them, that you're fine with whatever defaults that people... Man, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. So can I talk to you guys briefly about my friend AJ? My friend AJ has no use of his arms. Yeah. My friend AJ, who, by the way, would be giving a way better talk than I am. He uh, does accessibility talks all the time. Uh, in fact, the only reason I even do accessibility talks now is he's kind of stepped down from that scene to focus on you know, personal stuff. But like, he plays all of his games with his feet. He's a programmer. He's actually in the games industry. He's a programmer, programs with his feet. He is, he's a monster. Like, he is the most badass guy I know. Yeah. He can use a normal controller. But that is not optimal, especially for most games. Did you know that charities, like the Able Gamers charity, will actually go to, uh, to people who have uh, severe disabilities. They'll even go to people who don't have severe disabilities, but in this particular example, severe disabilities, who can't use things like their arms, or who can only use one arm, or, heaven forbid, can only move their heads, and will help make them custom controllers to be able to play these games. And sometimes, because they're making custom controllers, not everything translates super well from game to game. Madden doesn't really control like Devil May Cry. And if your game has remappable controls, that makes it way easier. Now, that's a big example. You know, how many people in the, in the US just can't use their arms? No, not a lot. That's, let's be fair here, not a lot. But I mean, if that's one, five, a hundred more customers than your game would previously have, and it's going to take you, what, an afternoon to put in remappable controls? Why not? Heck, one of the coolest things you can do is be like, here are three pre-selects of our designer's favorite controls. And by the way, like I said, I'm in a team of 12. I will design a control scheme for a game, and then like Steve will be like, that plays terribly. What are you doing? And then Mark will be like, yeah, no, I don't like that. And then Steve will be like, oh, you should play it like this. You know, and then Mark's like, I don't like that either. Why not come up with some pre-created control options? What, what's the problem? Then you're like, oh, by the way, you don't, want, you don't want any of those. Remap it. It's fine. You know, just remap whatever controls you want. These are just the ones we like the best. That way, you can more easily curate the experience if you're concerned about designer authorship. I mean, curated experiences are great. You know, games are inherently curated. I'm not speaking out against that. Not everything can be Minecraft. And not everything should be Minecraft. So the thing is that, like, what if, just saying, you have carpal tunnel? <laughs> and you're like, I can't. Oh, no, it's bad. No, don't want to press that button anymore. Can I just please use the trigger button for that command? Can I please use the D-pad that no one uses for anything? Just if I can press up on the D-pad and make that Y, that would be perfect. That actually happened to my wife, too. Yeah. She's like, oh, no, I'm going I'm to wrist, wrist thing. It wasn't even like a cast. It was just like a, like a little wrist guard. And she was in there for like two weeks. She's like, oh, no, it's bad. She could not play a lot of her games. And that, that was really upsetting, especially when you consider that a lot of the games she plays are RPGs. There is no reason an RPG, a game that's like, I move and I press a single button. There's no reason they can't have it where it's like, hey, any of these buttons, literally all of them, they do the same. Any of these sticks, they move the cursor. Just, you're welcome. But they don't. No, why would they? Why would they? They don't think about it. And I mean, to be fair, that is a problem with Japanese games culture. In Japanese games culture, there is unfortunately an issue with not really representing the idea that disabled people exist. 
disabled people in Japanese culture do tend to be more marginalized, and some of our favorite games do tend to come from Japan, meaning you don't get a lot of accessibility options from those games. But that's one of the cool things about the indie scene. How many JRPGs are indies making? Might as well put some accessibility options in there. Remappable controls, colorblind settings, it'd be absolutely great. Now, what about audio? Stereo monotoggle is a big deal. Now, before all of you think that my wife is literally falling apart, I can assure you she is. She's deaf in her left ear. <laughs> that, is a, that is a big issue. Also, I uh, just want to say, personal anecdote, um, my mother knows ASL. And then Christy, my wife, she knows ASL. And uh, they will sit in a room with me in that room and just sign at each other and then giggle. Oh, yeah. Now, I think they want me to learn ASL. I think this is the way of getting back at me. So the thing is that like most games use stereo audio, you know? Like a lot of games nowadays use surround sound, and that is so cool. You know, it's like, oh, certain sound effects come out of the left side, certain sound effects come out on the right side. You know, if any of you have ever listened to the Star Wars soundtrack, you know how awesome it is to have stereo audio. If you had a hi-fi system in the early 90s, throw in the, uh, the original Star, uh, Star Wars uh, soundtrack by John Williams and just rock out to it, because that was the best use of your hi-fi. THQ was just, oh, so good. Guess what? Not everyone can enjoy that. And if you're sitting in front of that hi-fi and you're like, okay, cool, I can hear very little of the right side section on this ear. What about stereo mono toggle? You can actually set it up where it's like, okay, both audio channels are coming out of the left side. Both audio channels are coming out of the right side. Both audio channels are coming out of both sides. If you want to get lazy, just have it again a stereo mono toggle. Mono has both audio channels coming out both speakers. Stereo has it where it just sort of selects. Even better than that, if you're working on a big sort of like epic game in full 3D, have them select what audio comes out of what speaker in their surround sound. And I can guarantee you that's not as hard as it sounds because most engines have that built in. And if you're just like running native C Sharp or something, you could just go Google how to do that. Again, it's like 10 minutes worth of work. This is not hard stuff. But you just have to design for it. Because the later you are in your design process, well, you're getting to the point where it's like, oh, we're near the end, and now I have to do this stereo mono toggle. Well, if you had it on your design document from the be very beginning, that wouldn't have been an issue. Right? One of my favorites, one of my absolute favorites. Dyslexia-friendly font options. And then also, high contrast UI. Or, you can even go further than that, rescalable UI. They have freely available, open source, dyslexia-friendly fonts. And some people are like, dyslexia-friendly fonts? What is a dyslexia-friendly font? So you know how, like, my brain, I mean, sorry, a dyslexic person's brain, We'll flip a B or a P or like a D, and they're like, oh, no, those are, those are the same thing. Or even weirder, like an A and an E. Sometimes it's like, like Z. It's like, oh, that Z, is that a Z or an S? I don't, I don't know. I have no, no clue. Is that a three? I don't, what is that? A dyslexia-friendly font makes every single letter have a unique silhouette from the others, meaning no matter how you flip that P, it will always look not like the D or not like the B. It's just like, oh no, it's cool. Like maybe the B has like a little little serif on the end of it, you know, to mark where down is. You know, stuff like that. Or maybe the line's slightly weird. Some of the dyslexia-friendly fonts look like, um, <laughs> I'm a little off color, look like a dyslexic person wrote them because my handwriting is not good. Like, you don't want to see my handwriting. So sometimes it's like, oh no, I, I remember seeing people write like that in elementary school. Oh, that's a little squaggle. But at the same time, they're not all like that. But almost every single one of them is completely for free online, open source. That's, that's something you can implement very easily. So thing is, what about like where the dialogue comes from? A big old like translucent, box of text. Those translucent boxes of text look really, really cool. They were doing that all the way back of the Super Nintendo translucent boxes of text. 
Yeah, no, um, you should have a way built into your game where you can snap it to just be all black. High contrast. It's like, okay, white text, black background, easier to read, not just for people who have dyslexia, but also people who have really poor eyesight. Uh, there are other reasons too, but uh, those are kind of the main ones. You can even go into your code, especially if you're using a true type font. And yes, I know if any of you work in Unity, you're like, ah, oh, true type font, what do you get out? Get out of here with that. We want to use sprite font. You can use with sprite font too, don't worry. True type is uh, a pain, I'm aware. Let them change their font size and their text scrolling speed. It's not going to kill you. So those are some of the really, really basics of accessibility options. Just things to think about. And before, a lot of you are like, oh yeah, other than like a wife who's falling apart and being super dyslexic, why do, you, why do you know anything about this? Well, our game Collapsus actually has over 40 accessibility options. We actually ended up winning the Able Gamers Accessibility Award at uh, GDAX, which is the Midwest's largest game development expo. Our team is really, really passionate about accessibility. That's why I like to come out to, to uh, schools like this and to, to events and things and give these kinds of talks. So go onto our website if you get a chance and, and really look at what we're doing with accessibility. Steal our ideas. Go to the Able Gamers, steal some of their ideas. The Able Gamers charity will actually hook you up with disabled playtesters. It's absolutely amazing. Talk to your disabled friends candidly about what prevents them from playing games. Go to events, talk to playtesters really examine the difficulty they have. Because at the end of the day, you're not just doing something to brighten someone's day. And if we're being real, isn't that why we make games? We make games because we love them. They touched us in some sort of way. Don't we want to do that to other people? To like give a swelling in their hearts every time they play our games? But if you have to be really cynical about it, are you really going to throw away hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of customers who don't get to play some games at all. Like, I know people who will buy a game just because they're like, oh, it has colorblind accessibility. I don't care for that genre, but I'm buying it because I at least I can play it. So I'm about to open up uh, for, uh, for questions. Uh, I have a feeling that we're going to run over slightly. <laughs> but luckily, I'm the next talk in here. So that's fine for me. Uh, so yeah, so does anyone have any questions? I live on questions. If I don't get any, then I'm going to be very sad. Question. Absolutely. Earlier you said something about being able to see like other artwork and colorblind palettes. Yes. How are you able to, is there a site for that? Um, so, um, it is the Able Gamers Charity. Um, they have a tool, and they talk about it quite a lot on their, their social media. Um, in fact, like, I think like once a week they, they plug it on their Facebook. Um, it is a tool that you download, and you run it, and what it does is it, it, it puts a filter over everything, and you can see it as a colorblind person would. Um, they don't have all nine of the most common, but they have the top five most common. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, it's a free tool. So just download it and run with that. Also, Photoshop has some plugins uh, on Adobe's website. Those are also completely free, where you can view in colorblind modes as well. Um, that's really helpful when you're actually making your, your art. So yeah, that's the Able Gamers charity. So yes, more questions? Absolutely. So I've seen a lot of games that will use um, orange and blue as like default colors. Like, Are those like kind of the universal um, colors to use for, like, you know, for colorblind people, or is there like a reason why those are used so commonly? Yes. Um, well, n not yes to the the first part, but yes to a, there's a reason. Um, orange and blue, most color blindnesses are fine with them, and that's absolutely true. Though there are some color blindnesses that are like, hey, that orange is now gray. And it's like that's really bad. And that's pretty common. The, uh, the thing is, though, that um, it's not a universal thing for colorblindness. The big reason it's used um, is because like, the very like, primal simian parts of our brains find those colors pleasing, because they're they contrast each other very well. Um, that's why a lot of films are graded as uh, blue and orange. Uh, you'll, you'll look at an Avengers movie or something, and you're like, that's a lot of blue and orange. You know? You'll have like, the dark blue shiny floor, and then like, big orange particle effects. It has more to do with the fact that people are like, that looks really cool than it does 
anything else because let's be honest a lot of the games industry and the film industry are kind of cynical about that sort of thing so i saw a question over here yeah, Ooh, hold on a second oh. they need to pick it up on the on the stream all right yeah i was just wondering like there's different types of color blindness mm -hmm. is there also different types of hearing impairment with like frequency or um, there absolutely is. Um, now, those are actually graded by the, the amount of decibels that they can hear. Um, generally speaking, um, that becomes less of a concern because um, mostly you're just like, oh, I have volume controls. Um, though there are certain uh, hearing types where like, I just can't hear bass, but I can hear like more treble and things like that. Um, though those probably have names, I'm not aware of them off the top of my head. Um, those are just like, Ha it, those are easy enough to solve by having bass slider, treble slider, high frequency sound uh, toggle, you know, things like that, as well as just good old fashioned volume controls. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, never just trust that someone's device will have good old fashioned volume controls. Always put built in volume controls as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be for background audio, music, and voice. You'd have those all three as separate controls just because, well, I mean, even people with sensory issues maybe don't want to have like all that going on. So yeah, hope that helps yeah. at least a little. Any more questions? What about vertigo issues? Um, so, um, so vertigo issues, that is, that is a really good question. Um, so that is becoming more and more of an issue in VR. Um, so on the VR end itself, um, the best way to solve most vertigo problems is actually to put in a 3D model nose. Um, because the human brain is uh, catered to seeing a nose normally, and when it doesn't, it gets really like messed up. Um, and so a lot of people are like, that's really dumb. But it's not the only solution, but it'll actually handle most of your vertigo issues right off the bat, just by having like a big triangle like right in the middle there. And if you can allow the user to change the color of that triangle based off of a slider, that's also better to better match their skin tone. Um, now, the thing is that beyond that, um, field, uh, like depth of field, so like changing like how blurry it gets beyond a certain point can help, um, as well as um, as well as like screen width, you know like how much of the screen can they see? So imagine imagine the controls for the camera in VR like a fisheye lens. Allow them to change how much of that fisheye that they can see. Additionally, the the screen's refresh rate, the lower latency the screen, the better it's going to be. However, it should be noted that the higher frame rate you have, more people are more susceptible to uh, to having uh, problems with that. So you tr in VR, while it's not a popular opinion, you're probably going to want to keep the frame rate of VR something closer to, uh, to 30 frames per second, um, though that's not always the case, and allowing people to sort of toggle between that, if possible, if your tool set allows you to, is better. Uh, and then also, motion let them turn off motion blur. There's so many games where people are like, oh, motion blur. Human eye doesn't see motion blur. The reason motion blur is in games is to try to create a cinematic experience, to try to replicate that sort of, uh, that sort of Spielberg style camera motion that was in Saving Private Ryan. It literally, that's how far it goes back, it was Saving Private Ryan. You didn't really have much motion blur before that, and in fact, you didn't even really have much replication of film cameras at all before that in games. Let them turn it off. If you must have it, and I don't even know why you must, especially in an immersive experience, just let them be like, no, no motion blur, please. Or at least changing like how intense it is. If you can put in a slider that goes from no motion blur to crazy motion blur and everything in between, that's the best. However, then you're having to deal with like camera settings and motion blur is really like intensive on like the, uh, the processing power. So just let them turn it off, please. But those should all be pretty good ways to um, reduce the effects of vertigo. Absolutely. Okay, yesterday we had another speaker who is visually impaired, mm -hmm. and he was showing us about how visually impaired people play games with sound. Yes. And do you guys go hand in hand with those games as well? Yeah, absolutely. No. Okay, so that's the thing. So I didn't get to touch on this, mostly because it was late. Um, but the thing is that 3D sound was one of the coolest things that was ever brought into video games, like, ever. Um, and so how 3D sound works is it basically um, allows, 
like if you happen to have like severe vis visual impairments, you can put your headphones on and you can you can hear. There's an enemy right over there. It's actually over there in that 3D space just because you could hear it over there. That's so cool. Stuff like Unity and Unreal does that as well. Um, now, the thing is that you have to have a really dedicated sound designer to make that happen. And you have to be very thoughtful of where you place your sound nodes. A lot of the stuff that I was talking about previously was really quick and dirty tricks that are like done like so you can, you can make them like super fast. Um, 3D sound is something that takes a lot more work. But if you can master it, Oh my god, it's so, it's so vital for people with, with audio impairments. Now, the reverse of that. I'm not a huge fan of like PUBG and Fortnite and, and, and things like that, but um, Fortnite has, um, has the opposite. In Fortnite, 3D sound is a big part of the gameplay mechanic, um, where you're like, oh, there's, I hear there's a grenade over there. They have a 3D sound HUD. It's a ring in the middle that you can turn on, and it'll actually show a symbol for a grenade and then an arrow pointing in the direction where that sound went off. Do that. If there's anything people should be stealing from Fortnite, it's not all the other things that are just stolen from somewhere else. That's the true innovation, is that 3D sound HUD. It's so good. So yeah. So I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So we are done. We're going to wrap this one up. Um, and again, I've been Jay Kidd from Wraith Games. Uh, my next talk in here is actually going to be about building a killer press kit and getting seen by the games press. So if you'd like to stay put for that, that's going to be starting in just a couple minutes uh, while I you know, just breathe. Um, and so yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this talk. <laughs>